welcome everyone to this uh, uh, Claring Cafe uh, titled uh, Claring Cafe on Computational Assist Computer Assisted Pragmatic Annotation of Native and Le Learner Corpora. Uh, for those who are new to Claring Cafes, uh, this is uh, an online and informal space of discussion for all things relevant for the Claring infrastructure and for language resources in general. Uh, today's uh, Claring Cafe is organized by colleagues from the University of Innsbruck and uh, Roma Tre in collaboration with the Austrian Academy of Science. And uh, I am Francesca Frontini. I'm your Clarin host from the Clarin Board of Directors. The technical support is provided by David Bordon. Uh, the event is recorded for dissemination purposes. And uh, uh, if you have questions or comments, uh, put them in the chat. If you prefer not to be recorded, you can switch your camera off. So this is today's uh, schedule. I will give a very brief introduction about uh, what Claring is for those who don't know. And uh, David will also put uh, the link to our three minutes video if you want to check it out later on. And then I'll hand over to the organizers of uh, this uh, cafe, which will introduce uh, today's topic. Uh, it's, uh, uh, it, its aim is to present uh, the uh, these two corpora, this deer and ladder, and uh, the uh, challenges in uh, annotating it both manually and automatically. And there will also be uh, some interesting reflection on how to this, the corpora and results were published and long-term archived in uh, the uh, Austrian uh, Archie repository, which is something that uh, of course is of relevance for, for CLARIN. So uh, what is CLARIN? CLARIN stands for Common Language Resources and Technology Infrastructure. It is a European Research Infrastructure Consortium, and it is uh, recognized by the European Science Forum for Research Infrastructures as a landmark, so an established infrastructure. And its aim is to provide easy and sustainable access for scholars in the humanities and social sciences and beyond to digital language data in written, spoken, and multimodal form, to advance tools to discover, explore, exploit, annotate, and analyze them wherever they are located, and if needed, also through a, a single sign-on environment so that you can access uh, uh, password-protected protect resources with your own uh, identifiers, academic identifiers. Clarin also serves as an ecosystem for knowledge sharing and training, and this is, of course, the Clarin cafes are also part of this uh, aspect of Clarin. And it is, we collaborate with other re, re, uh, European research infrastructures, uh, of the, especially of the social sciences and humanities cluster, and more broadly with the European Open Science Cloud. You can read Clarence Value Proposition at this address. Uh, generally speaking, Clarence is defined as a distributed research infrastructure. We are uh, 24 me uh, full members uh, and two observers. And uh, Claring is hosted, so Claring's resources are generally hosted at uh, 70 centers in our member states. Mm -hmm. And in order to uh, make the data and uh, knowledge uh, available from all of these distributed centers uh, findable from a single access point, uh, Claring has developed uh, a technical infrastructure that is built on harvesting of metadata that are then uh, made available via a single access point, which is the Claring Virtual Language Observatory, from where you can search for language resources such as corpora, tools, and others. And from the yellow, you can also activate the language resources switchboard to find services and tools that can be used to process these uh, resources. So our offer is high quality interoperable data, tools, models, and metadata, high level accessibility and usability of data models and uh, tools and services. And of course, uh, we promote the active collaboration and knowledge exchange with, within our network and beyond. This is also done by, by organizing an annual conference, events such as Claring Cafes and also face-to-face -face workshops, 
um, teaching and training activities and case centers. And uh, uh, indeed, we uh, Kleiner also has a number of dedicated committees, such as the legal and ethical issues and standards and the interoperability committee. There is a network of user involvement representatives throughout uh, the various uh, national consortia. As I already mentioned, uh, clearing knowledge centers cover various topics of expertise and allow uh, and are offering help, help desk services and also mobility grants. And there is a trainers network and a clearing ambassadors network uh, so that we can better reach out to our users. And yeah, as I, I wanted to point out, the call for the annual conference is now uh, published and you uh, could consider submitting your contributions. Uh, we also um, publish um, impact stories, uh, such as the one that you see here, to showcase what uh, the cloud infrastructure can do for researchers. And we illustrate uh, with more in-depth the uh, offer of our uh, local nodes uh, in uh, uh, the tour de Clarin. And uh, with the, uh, this, I hand over to the organizers of today's uh, cafe for the rest of the program. So thank you. Um, the main focus of this presentation is the description of the machine learning pragmatic annotation assistant, assistant ladder web. Uh, to train the machine, we use data from two previously collected corpora, ladder and is there. The question is, um, uh, the question for, um, for this section uh, of the presentation is why have these corpora recreated and how are they structured? But first of all, can they be defined as a corpora? According to the definition of Mac, Enric, Xiao and Tono, a corpus is an authentic, representative and machine readable collection of linguistic data is authentic as a solely comprised instances of language used by real speakers rather than a single ideal speaker. Moreover, it's representative at its goal is to encompass a sample of language data suitable for a specific inquiry, thereby reflecting a particular genre or variety. Lastly, it's machine readable, implying that the data is stored electronically and accessible through a dedicated software interface so a concordancer facilitating the processing of large volume of data simultaneously. So are these the ladder corpora? They are authentic. Uh, yes, they are, because they are authentic. And they are authentic because they include only instances of language that are used by real speakers and not by a single ideal, ideal speaker. But these data are elicited and more details uh, will follow in the, in the next slides. They are also representative because they aim to include a sample of language data, certain speech acts in our case, um, that is appropriate to a given aim of inquiry, to so being able to reflect a certain genre or variety. In this case, Italian as one, Italian as L2, and other language and varieties. They are also machine readable uh, data, indicated that the data is stored in electronic format and accessible through a dedicated software interface, in this case, Ladder Web. However, pragmatic annotation, as we will discuss, cannot solely rely on automatic processes like common concordancer, which annotated text based on lexical and morphosyntactic criteria. Consequently, the data quantity is moderate compared to prototypical data. And now I give the word to my colleague in Rome. Thank you. Uh, this year and ladder um, were collected in different contexts, and um, but they share uh, several characteristics. So we will try and um, go into detail uh, about these characteristics. First of all, Oh, sorry. Uh, first of all, uh, they both focus on uh, pragmatics and specifically on speech act realization and on uh, real life media such as email and instant messaging. In both cases, data were collected online with the help of students, and we will see how. Uh, in both cases, as anticipated by Nicola, uh, they contain elicited data. 
and uh, they were collected to allow for uh, intercultural and cross-cultural research. And finally, uh, both this year and Ladder um, focus on also on less commonly investigated languages, for example, uh, Austrian, German, and Italian. As for, for the first, uh, first point, um, we um, already know that pragmatics has to do with the relation between context and language. Uh, please, Nicola. Um, so the relation between uh, language and context and between uh, a language and its users. And um, our specific perspective is, is that of uh, speech act theory, meaning that we uh, see utterances and sentences um, as actions. Uh, specifically, this dear and ladder um, target um, for speech acts, uh, which were selected for different reasons. Um, cancellation um, was selected because uh, it was a, it is a speech act that um, is um, under investigated. Uh, no one investigated cancellation before we did so. Uh, so it was interesting to um, deal with the new speech act in research. Uh, on the other hand, we also uh, have refusals uh, which are similar to cancellations, but they are frequently investigated. So uh, they can help in um, devising the criteria to uh, study cancellations. Uh, another one is request, uh, which is um, probably the most commonly investigated uh, speech act ever. So it is interesting to have new data on the same speech act uh, to compare um, data, th these new data with other uh, previously uh, collected. And finally, we have apologies. Um, and uh, this is a, a, an interesting speech act because apology is often used uh, um, to complement other speech acts. Uh, it is used as a supportive move to other speech acts. Uh, this, the, the third point, uh, the second point uh, um, shared by uh, this dear and ladder is that uh, data uh, were collected online using um, questionnaires on Google Forms, and um, students were involved, meaning that uh, the informants were uh, students from the University of Innsbruck and from uh, Romatera University. And, but these students were uh, both informants and researchers because they uh, contacted other people outside university and administered the questionnaires to them. And a small part of the um, ladder corpus is also um, collected among uh, speakers of L2 um, Italian taking a um, certification exam at Roma 3. Data um, have been collected uh, anonymously, so we, uh, we don't know the uh, identity of uh, the respondents, but we collected several uh, metadata useful for uh, research. Uh, for example, age, gender, place of birth, uh, and so on and so forth. Okay, so... Uh... Yeah, so um, uh, this is um, um, related to the instrument that we use to collect uh, the data. So we had the questionnaire, and the questionnaire, as previously said, uh, was uh, included some questions about uh, general uh, information, so, um, uh, so by uh, their profile. And then um, it, it contained also the DCT. The DCT is a largely used uh, tool in the, in the field of pragmatics uh, that is um, basically um, a prompt uh, to which we, act, we, we ask uh, the informants to react uh, with a specific uh, linguistic uh, behavior. In the case of uh, of this um, this project, we asked them to produce, for example, a cancellation or a refusal or or something like that. So um, the DCT is a discourse complexion task that is largely used, and it has many advantages. Like for example, 
the, the very rapid collection of high amount of data in comparison to other types of uh, techniques, like for example, the role plays or or ma more natural um, uh, instruments uh, that can take a, a, a lot of time. We also have um, uh, the possibility to compare uh, the data uh, collected under the same conditions. Um, we also can control some, uh, some variables like the familiarity be between the interlocutors, the degree of formality and so on. And by using the DCT, we can also bypass some ethical problems because it's not a real situation. So we don't have privacy problems. And uh, by filling out the, um, the questionnaire, the informants give automatically uh, consent to, uh, 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 the, 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 there is a, a disclaimer in the, in the questionnaire. So they, they give consent. We also have some some limitations, so uh, the lack of naturalness uh, in respect in relation to um, to natural produced uh, language in a in a in a contextual in a in a real situation, and for that reason we don't have um, a rich context in the data collected. For example, in a in a refusal, we don't have all the other um, uh, um, turns in the conversation. Uh, we also had uh, some uh, translation translation issues that can be related to um, cultural uh, aspects. So it's not always, it can be a challenge as well. And uh, most of all, we have to rely on the int introspection and the offline knowledge. So people, the informants, uh, write uh, what they think they would say in that situation and not actually what they say in that situation. So we ask them to produce a, a reaction that is uh, how they perceive that situation and not actually uh, that situation in their real life. So that's why this is related to unnaturalness of the, uh, of the, of the data collected here. Um, Nicola, please. We have some uh, a couple of prompts here, um, as you can see, one from this deer and one from uh, Lader. So we have a cancellation um, in which we ask uh, the informants uh, something like, a friend has invited you over for dinner tonight and you said you would go. However, at the last minute you send a message saying you are not going, what would you write? So in this, type of uh, uh, prompt, they have to write the message they would write in that for that situation. Uh, so this is an instant message. And in the second example, as you can see here, we are asking um, uh, to produce an email uh, that is intended to um, to Professor Broca, which, uh, and, and they need to request him through the, through the email. Um, in this um, in these examples here, we can see two uh, degrees of social distance. So we uh, in the first one we ask uh, the informants to produce um, a cancellation uh, to a friend uh, to uh, um, uh, in, a, in an event that the informant has been involved. So a friend has invited you over for dinner. And this is a low a distance situation. And the second one is a, is a high level um, distance situation uh, because we ask the people to uh, answer or they have to answer to a neighbor uh, to, um, uh, to cancel um, an invitation. And um, in this, um, slide you can see a couple of examples in Austrian German L1 and Italian L1 so uh, uh, this type of uh, research allows us to observe how people uh, do the same thing in in different languages so uh, for example uh, cancellation how uh, Austrian Germans uh, in Austrian German we can um, we can cancel 
and uh, in Italian, for example. So we can use the same categories as you are going to see in the next slides. We can use the same uh, categories for, um, for the annotation uh, across several languages, and then we can compare them. Uh, we can also do um, another type of comparison that is the uh, between uh, L1 and L2 speakers, as you can see in the example, in the first example here, we have an L1 speaker of uh, Italian. So uh, this is uh, produced by that native speaker. And in the, sec in the second one, we have an, an, a non-native speaker of Italian. So we can compare not only uh, cross-culturally, but also um, uh, at the level of the, um, we can observe also at the level of the interlanguage. Uh, so two different types of uh, observations. Um, and with this slide, I, I, I give the word to my uh, colleague, Nicola. Yes, uh, I will show you the architecture of the corpora in terms um, um, of volume and uh, other characteristics. They are um, built differently because they purpose uh, uh, was uh, was different. Leather's aim is to investigate Italian L2 learners' production. Uh, therefore, it constitutes a collection of L2 data just approximate with parallel L1 data. The data sources from various text genre as email, instant messages, voice messages, as you can see in the first column, and uh, various speech acts, as you can see in the third column including requests, cancellation, refusal, apology. The primary objective is to facilitate an interlinguistic L1, L2, as Diego said, comparison. On the other hand, uh, this DIR specializes in gathering speech acts of cancellation across different languages and varieties, primarily focused on L1 data. Its primary goal is to conduct cross-linguistic comparisons. From this corpora, we extract a subcorpus, which we uh, which was annotated um, uh, for other scientific articles, and uh, we use this uh, annotated corpus to train the uh, the machine. You can see uh, the yellow one is the the data that we use for the training. Uh, and here you can see a graphic visualization of uh, the corpora and uh, of the training data. Once again, the Italian data consists of both request and cancellation, whereas the German data exclusively comprises cancellations. So in this second um, chapter of our presentation, uh, Maria Rudigia, Valenti, and I will illustrate how annotation operates within the studies in linguistic pragmatics. We will detail the specific annotation scheme we adapted to categorize requests and cancellations. Furthermore, we will present examples of natural annotation to demonstrate our methodology in practice. Finally, we will discuss some challenges we encountered during the annotation process. Traditionally, the, uh, as um, Eva said, uh, requests in pragmatic studies are traditional, well investigated. The traditional, uh, according to the well accepted coding scheme by Bloom Kulka, the act of requests are div divided into the directiveness of the head act, which can be direct, conventionally, indirect, or non conventionally direct, indirect. So uh, more detailed description follow. So uh, direct uh, request uh, is when the speaker explicitly states the action desired by the hearer. For example, what time is it? Conventionally indirect, the speaker use a question or statement that conventionally implies the request but does not explicitly state it. Like, uh, do you have the time? And finally, for non-conventionally indirect requests, the speaker makes the request in a way that requires more inference on the part of the hearer, often hinting at desired action rather than stating it directly, like, oh, I lost my watch, uh, 
and so on. But uh, there is not only uh, the add act, in this case, uh, the request to be annotated, but also linguistic uh, realization, like uh, modality, tense, the difference, for example, or, uh, between uh, can I or the uh, could I, and um, also uh, supporting move that uh, can uh, um, um, uh, anticipate uh, the request. Supporting move can, per, for example, be like um, uh, grounders, reason or justification for the request, uh, preparator, um, for example, or um, uh, um, I will ask you a favor, or disarmer, for example, I know it's very late, but uh, I have to ask you something, and so on. And now, Valentin, okay. we address uh, our adopted scheme for request. Yeah, thank you, Nicola. Um... For coding the requests, we used an adaptation of a categorization system developed by Nutzo and Cortes Velasquez in 2020. It's based on a simpler way of organizing speech acts created by Blum Kulka in 1989. And this system sees the smallest parts of speech acts, called subacts, as key units of the speech act itself without uh, separating them into head act and supportive moves. The benefit of this method is that it uh, lets us look at data more inductively and uh, draw conclusions without assuming a certain order. Um, all subacts are seen as equally important in conveying the main point of the speech act. And this approach makes analysis easier by not needing to separate different types of requests. And it also makes it less subjective because the coders only focus on what's said without guessing uh, hidden meanings, for example. Plus, it uh, works well with computer-driven analysis and also fits better to our data since there are no indirect requests um, within them. Um, a separate analysis layer focuses on morphosyntactic, uh, lexical, and proxemic modifiers like emoticons or emojis. Um, this classification offers insight into the request formulation strategies, but it varies from the previous classification as it only relies on identifying single linguistic features, uh, including uh, pictographs. And the taxonomy of modifiers uh, contributes to a more fine-grained analysis of requests based on visible and uh, countable markers. In our data, we have identified 10 types of subjects and 11 types of modifiers, uh, which will be presented here. Um, on this slide, you can see the taxonomy of subjects. As mentioned before, we have 10 types, um, which are listed here. As a matter of time, um, I won't explain all of them to you, only a few, which will also appear in our example later on. For example, we have an opener, which um, introduces a message, the preparator, which is seen to prepare the addressee for the speech act itself, an explanation, which describes the circumstances of the request, the request itself, um, and towards the ending of the messages, there often appears a formula of gratitude to come across more politely and also farewell uh, formula. Now here, the taxonomy of the modifiers is displayed. Um, as mentioned before, there are 11 types um, which are divided into syntactical and lexical modifiers. Some interesting ones which will appear also in our example are, for example, the endearment, often in combination with an emoji, um, which qualifies the relationship between the speaker and the addressee. Um, hedge, which are expressions like uh, maybe um, to express doubt and therefore aims to reduce the expectations. Um, the conditional mood, which is a syntactical modifier uh, used to generate the feeling that uh, the things said are not real. Um, and also, most time the, the requests are 
formulated as a question, so the interrogative um, form is often used. And on this slide, now you can see an example of the analysis, which is a message written in an informal context, so with low social distance between the interlocutors. Um, the, the request uh, or the, the message is, hi guys, I have a problem because I lost my library card. Perhaps some of you could lend me theirs. Thank you and see you soon. Um, below the message, you can see the two layers. In the first line, there are the subacts. So hi guys would be the opener of the message, which is also as a modifier, this form of endearment um, in combination with the emoji. Then I have a problem can be seen as a preparator for the next one, the explanation, because I lost my library card. And now the request itself, um, which contains um, hedging um, with the form perhaps, or the conditional mood could. Um, and also, as I said before, this request is stated as a question, so the interrogative. And towards the ending of the message, um, this gratitude form, thank you and a farewell and see you soon. Now my colleague Maria will continue with the coding scheme for cancellations. Yes, thank you. I will continue with the taxonomy, which was developed for the pragmatic annotation of cancellations. For the annotation of the cancellations, we used the non-hierarchical taxonomy proposed by Diego Cortes Velasquez and Elena Nuzzo for the annotation of last minute cancellations, which was also adapted for the taxonomy of requests. This coding scheme assumes the existence of subacts as the minimum elocutionary units that constitute speech acts. And as we already heard, major characteristics of this approach are that it does not differentiate between head act and supportive moves, and that it only focuses on what is explicitly expressed. Also, each language unit has to be as assigned to only one pragmalinguistic function. And like in the coding scheme for the requests, the taxonomy is based on the distinction between subacts and modifiers, 12 types of subacts, some of which may have different realization strategies, and four types of modifiers were identified for the annotation of the cancellations. And the advantages of this approach, including simplification of the analysis, reduction of subjectivity, and inductive rather than deductive methodology were already mentioned by Valentin when presenting the coding scheme for the requests. The table on the slide shows the 12 different sub acts which were distinguished for the analysis of the cancellations together with their different realization strategies. Let us have a look at four sub acts in more detail, which will be relevant for the example of cancellation analysis that we're going to discuss later. For example, the sub act alerter serves to get the addressee's attention and can be realized either in the form of a call for attention or a greeting. An example for a call for attention would be listen, and an example for a greeting would be hello. Then the subact remedial move consists in saying you're sorry or asking for forgiveness. The subact cancellation has four different realization strategies depending on the level of directness. And its function is to communicate that someone is not attending the event they had previously agreed to attend. And finally, an offer of repair consists in a promise to repair somehow for cancelling. And there are three realization strategies here, um, offering an alternative meeting, offering an unclear alternative, or offering no alternative but just an explanation. On the next slide, we can see the four different types of modifiers which are included in the taxonomy of cancellations, downtoner, evaluation, intensifier, and term of endearment. Let's have a look at an example of analysis for the cancellations um, to get a better understanding of the taxonomy. Um, the me text message is, honey, hi, sorry, but I just can't make it tonight. Never mind, then I'll explain better tomorrow morning. There were four different subacts identified in the message. 
namely an alerter, honey high. Then we have a remedial move with Surrey. And, but I just can't make it tonight is the cancellation. And finally, never mind. then I'll explain better tomorrow morning is an offer of repair. And the message also contains two modifiers, just a second, yes, thank you. Um, a term of endearment, namely honey, and an intensifier, namely just. For the analysis of the requests and the cancellations, we worked with the software Envivo, which facilitates corpus-based quantitative analysis and allows multiple coders to work on the same source. As illustrated on the slide, subacts and modifiers can be easily tagged in the messages. Um, we can see, for example, how the cancellation was highlighted and then tagged in the different messages. And on the right hand side, you can see all the different coding stripes, um, which correspond to the subacts and modifiers that were identified in the messages. And furthermore, Envivo allowed us to download the annotated data um, as Word documents. So these could then be easily used as data for the training of the leather web application. Ultimately, let's address some challenges that we encountered during the annotation. Um, the ambiguity in language use posed a challenge in the annotation process as a certain degree of interpretation is always required. And things like, for example, irony in language use might be um, hard to identify. Moreover, the pragmatic function of each language unit is not always clear and explicit, and the same expression might assume different pragmatic values and thus correspond to different subacts. However, the applied methodology does not allow pragmatic polysemy, and each language unit had to be assigned to only one single linguistic um, unit, and thus one pragmatic function or subact. All of this shows that there is a certain degree of subjectivity involved in manual annotation processes. But to overcome these challenges, different measures were taken that helped reducing subjectivity. Firstly, during teamwork sessions in which we familiarized ourselves um, with the coding schemes and carried out training, guidelines for the analysis were also established. And then the coders worked independently using the Envivo software, but there were always two coders assigned to each task of analysis for reciprocal control. After the annotation, the interrater agreement was checked with Cohen's Kappa. And in the few cases in which the agreement was low or in which the coders had doubts, consensus meetings were um, helped um, to finally then make a decision. And ultimately, random checks and audits of the analyzed data were performed to ensure reliability of the results. And as we can see here, the presented taxonomies for requests and cancellations were used for the training of the letter corpus annotation web application. So the letter web application was built on these taxonomies. So we have now a plan um, discussion, uh, discussion uh, of about 10 minutes before we proceed with the technical side of corpora collections and uh, uh, the creation of the app. While we are waiting for uh, other questions, I, I have one. Uh, so were there um, practical issues uh, in, uh, so you have combined two different corpora and uh, uh, I assume maybe there were also different types of encoding or formalisms and uh, was it, uh, did you have technical issues in reusing uh, these, uh, these resources uh, and in combining them? I can try to give it a reply and maybe the other um, colleagues can uh, complete. Uh, if I'm missing something. So uh, we collected um, the corpora for different purposes, uh, but uh, the annotation was quite similar because we um, work uh, uh, both uh, in this constellation uh, for this deer and ladder. Um, and uh, so the annotation scheme um, 
was uh, the same uh, for, um, for example, for um, the, the cancellations. Uh, and uh, uh, the request uh, adopted another scheme, as Maria told, and Maria and Valentin. Uh, but uh, they had uh, a lot of uh, overlapping, um, and mostly the strategy were the same. Uh, so when we, for example, asked the app, uh, um, so for example, to have an um, excuse, or, I don't know, apology, we probably have uh, apology both in uh, uh, in request and uh, in uh, um, cancellations. So, and uh, there is, uh, they are very compatible. The results are very, very compatible. Yeah. Maybe we can also compare and say, okay, maybe in request, there are not so much uh, uh, apologies as a sub acts as uh, in, in the cancellation, uh, as in the requests. We work for both. Um, yeah, we had maybe a problem because the uh, apology were first uh, um, annotated with um, without in vivo, and then uh, we transfer our results in in vivo in order to uh, have the same up output that it was then readable for um, for the training. That was mm -hmm. maybe yeah. Uh, that's uh, what issue. something I would yeah what I was thinking mm -hmm. about. So the the software the tool compatibility and interoperability with the tool was uh, an issue, but not a difficult one, right? Right. Um. Maybe I can add some some um aspects to this question. Uh, there are few differences in encoding. Sometimes it's just concerning uh upper and lower case uh, of the of tech use. However, it is, um, so you, you cannot, you cannot just uh, take two corpora and combine it without, without uh, data cleaning. Uh, this process will had to be done. And, uh, but, but since uh, the, the text use are quite similar and uh, also the categories uh, used are quite similar, uh, there was not a big issue. Uh, however, it's it's it, it, so um, I did not achieve the automatic uh, fusion of data corpora um, just through just take those uh, word word files and put them together. This this was not doable. Um, I had to write a separate uh, conversion routines uh, to turn turn each data set in and, and to clean out their uh, special yeah speciality uh, peculiarities and to fuse them. Not a big issue, but some work to do. So. And I guess that uh, there would be documentation if uh, someone else wanted to carry out a similar annotation on uh, their own corpora, right? Yes. Um, according to the annotation scheme, we have um, some annotation that we also put in the bibliography. Uh, we'll, we'll come to, to that later. Yeah. And I also think probably in the, in the deposit, in the ARC repository, there is probably also linked to this documentation. So we will hear it uh, in a few seconds uh, when the next presentation starts, right? As for this deal, you said you uh, focused um, mainly on instant messages, if I'm not mistaken. Um, why? I mean, I can understand maybe why instant messaging is more uh, could be more significant for this kind of um, speech art, but like um, you didn't include voice messages or is something that I missed? Yes, uh, we did indeed. Okay. Um, first, um, we um, was easier to collect uh, uh, written data are easier to collect. Um, so because we can um, ask uh, in an online questionnaire to write, to simulate, to write an instant message, but we cannot to ask to, to write an or a vocal message. So we had to had a good setting to collect uh, oral data. And uh, we tried to collect oral data firstly with an online questionnaire 
uh, with a software called Gorilla. But uh, we noticed that it was quite difficult because uh, people uh, were quite adverse uh, to, uh, to, to speak uh, uh, alone uh, online. And uh, we collected, we had a very, very few um, uh, response ratio. So we collected uh, the vocal data uh, during the um, uh, Italian proficiency exam uh, in Roma 3, as I'm asserted, where we uh, asked with the help of the um, people, the tester, if it was possible to add um, the question that we use for the uh, written questionnaire for a task like uh, the same cancellation that was uh, uh, asked in the written setting were also proposed the same uh, script were also proposed to produce an uh, a, a vocal message so the um, um, uh, the candidate exam candidate was asked to to reply to the script like uh, please make uh, you are uh, not going to your neighbor uh, and uh, you you write uh, you 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 speak up uh, all uh, your your cancellation imagine to do that so they were registered with their consent and then we transcribed uh, their uh, voice however these uh, vocal messages are transcript and they are available in the corpora online but are not part of the training because they are still not annotated it would be interesting to see if this uh, it can be easily annotated with the, the, the written data that uh, uh, make part of the training data that are inside uh, the, the uh, app now. Yes, I was, that, that's really interesting. I was asking you this because I, uh, like, um, a question that popped up in my mind was uh, whether it, was, it would be different, uh, like the, uh, the annotation, it would be different um, from um, the uh, point of view of, of a voice message, like the, the means could be like, could influence the, the way in which we express the same, the same thing basically. So that, 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 that was my curiosity basically. So thank, thank you. It's, it's, it's very interesting um, research question. And maybe you can use, uh, someone can use ladder to, to resolve this question. Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, we, we wanted to add something, maybe also you can, uh, well, I, I, I wanted to say that um, we, we started to work on, on this deal back in 2015, 16, yeah. and, and in the first part of uh, this deal, so for, for some of the data that we collected, uh, uh, the first thing that we did was to think of uh, an instant message, message uh, on WhatsApp because at that time there were no vocal messages um, uh, in the, as, as a service in, the, in WhatsApp. So by that time, the only thing that people uh, could use uh, was uh, the right message. So the first time for for that time we ask a, an instant message because what was uh, available at that time and then we started to think as 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 nicola was saying uh, in the later years um uh, to include uh, vocal messages because now it's widespread and and everybody's using them but um yeah that was basically one of the reasons for which uh, a, a big part of the corpus is, um, is written made messages. My question will be very quick. Um, did you, I don't know if you said it before, but did you consider age uh, in your in your work or maybe age differences uh, between your informants, like people writing the text? Yes, thank you. Uh, in the our metadata, um... Uh, you can sort uh, outputs by age. Oh, okay. uh, the corpus is not balanced by age. Uh, so we collected uh, data mostly uh, with um, uh, the help of uh, students. So some data are uh, between learners of uh, Italians. So they are not balanced by age. However, you can 
filter the data by age and probably come out to have uh, uh, compare comparable groups. Um, yeah, like I was thinking about comparing generations or something like that will be will be interesting. Okay, thank you. Maybe possible. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I can add that. Unfortunately, uh, we as the corpus is not balanced, we cannot um, compare generations now. <laughs> <laughs> but maybe in, in the future, if we can yeah. collect more data from uh, elder people, uh, then we can uh, explore also this um, path of inquiry. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, that would be the same also for uh, other variables as as gender, for example, that has been explored in in some in some projects, or also um another specific character like the the variety of language that they speak like uh for example for italian it can be also different uh, north uh, north from south or uh, there there are several several variables we collected also uh, that kind of data but um we we haven't been able to uh, compare um uh, it, um, to it's to make these comparisons, so it's absolutely important, and 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 we think that working with this type of of project and being able to um, include new data could be it could help to understand better uh, this variation. So uh, now we start with the second part, as I announced, and uh, Seta uh, Stuche will uh, uh, introduce uh, the her activity on uh, publication and archiving in Clary. Uh, thank you. Um, so should I share my own screen, or are you just gonna press next for me? When I am I will I will I will take the presentation. Sure. Okay, thank you. Um, so yes, let maybe I can introduce myself first because I guess I'm a bit of an outsider in the group. Um, I am Seta Stuhet uh, from the Austrian Center for Digital Humanities and Cultural Heritage at the Austrian Academy of Sciences. That was long. Um, and yes, I am one of the curators at uh, Arte, which is our repository. So I first thought of maybe saying a few words about Arche. Um, Arche is a digital archive uh, that we are hosting since 2017. Um, it's a certified um, uh, repository by Core Trust Seal and also as a Clarin B Center. Um, this also means that uh, it's a highly uh, curated repository, which means there is no self-upload or so, but all the data that is deposited in Arche is, um, well, goes through one of us uh, who checks the data and metadata and so on. Um, yeah. So Arche is also quite linked with, uh, um, with Clarin because uh, its very beginnings were, it was the project as the Clarin Center of Vienna especially for language resources. Uh, and then in 2017, the, it grew, it expanded. So now we don't accept only um, language resources, but also all humanities data. And uh, our connection at the moment, as mentioned, we are a Clarion B Center. Um, and also um, the data, well, metadata gets grabbed by um, Clarion. So we have two options really to how we deliver. Um, and one is to virtual language observatory and one is as federated content search to um, for the on the fly search in the, in the corpora. Um, so yes, I was now, I am now in the process of archiving the latter and this year uh, data. Um, it's a longer process, so it is not finished yet. But um, these two links that you can see here on the slide are the final persistent identifiers where all the data will be um, reachable and accessible. 
So um, we decided to make two collections. Now, if I explain how this is done in Agfa, it's basically uh, one collection where you have all the uh, files and subfolders in, just like you basically have them on your computer. And every single file and every single folder gets its own metadata. Um, and this one is now for ladder. Um, so I now create a metadata for it. Um, we here you can also see how the data will be um, structured inside of this collection. You can see we have instance messages, mail and vocal messages, and each one of the um, raw data has also the readme file with it. And will be all of these things will be accompanied also with the uh, metadata each. And this is the same thing I have done now for this tier. Um, also very important in ATA for us is that every single resource has a license so that the potential reusers always know how um, they can reuse the data. Uh, we also add quite a lot of um, information so that it is directly visible to the user. And we are currently preparing um, a new GUI, uh, a new user interface design. So it's shortly, I hope it won't look like this anymore. Um, and there with the new design, it will also be a new search. So you will be able to search through all these um, um, facets of metadata. But already now we are also um, providing a full text search also through the files themselves. So theoretically, you should be able to find also the words that appear inside of the files or inside of the corpora. Uh, yes, and these are the files that are then coming into um, this tier collection. Um, what we also did is that we have uh, an option of linking other resources with um, this collection, which means like publications, these are just metadata, but I got a list of publications, so they are all linked to the external, um, through Adobe, through, to a, the external repositories, like in Zenodo, I believe that Ladder was first published, the first version. Mm -hmm. So we have also linked it to there. Um, yes, and what I also did is that we have set um, the, um, and ladder to be linked to be harvested by Clarin. This means that in metadata, I have set it to be um, harvested by the virtual uh, language observatory. This is already set. It is not yet done so because it will only be once the data is finally published. As I mentioned, I am right now still in the process. Um, all what you saw is currently at our curation instance. And once everybody is satisfied with what I did, then um, we will push this on the production version. And then you will also be able to see this in Clarin. Uh, yes, so as you've seen, currently the data that we are archiving are CSVs because we prefer non-proprietary file formats. Um, and these are just raw data, so not annotated. Um, yes. and. I hope that, yeah, soon enough, you will be able to also download them. Thank you very much. So Joseph will present now um, how the machine learning methods to annotate and mediate data was built. So um, Nicola, thank you very much. Um, I don't think I want to introduce myself right now. Uh, well, I haven't prepared um, introductory uh, self interactive slides, uh, but yeah, I, I'll give shortly just uh, some technical characteristic of the web app. And uh, I think Nicola was, we have three uh, short videos to show how, how it uh, works or does not work yet. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the first thing uh, we have to do. Uh, was so after collecting all the data from from Leda and you know, this year, 
uh, find um, a data model. Oh, no, you, you can see me, right? Yes. Yeah, okay. Um, you can find find the data model uh, that's, that can be used to comp to take as much data as possible, as much data, metadata, speaker, um, and, 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 and uh, creation tasks, or so the task that's given uh, to the speakers uh, as much as possible, such that we can filter those data later and, and, and do selective uh, corpus uh, uh, analysis if needed. Um, so the web application right now uh, captures the following data. So first, of course, the text, uh, whether uh, it's right now it's only capable of, of, of taking up text in written form. So no voice recording uh, right now. There will be an internal ID and uh, one so-called alternative ID that can be used to link back to the um, to this year and other and maybe also other other corpora created through admins. Uh, the content, of course, uh, the language is used. Uh, we allow right now German and Italian. Uh, I can so the task given to the speakers, so under which circumstances uh, these, these things, are, uh, these texts are produced. Uh, this is, I think, uh, especially, especially in pragmatic analysis uh, of corpora uh, most important. So you, uh, one, one should always have, uh, have, have the context of, of action uh, in, in focus. And some metadata on speakers. So it's about right now the age at the uh, um, of the creation of the text, um, gender, L1s, L2s, and location of the speaker. So, but um, it's it's very broad, and uh, they yeah, we can widen it um, still. However, it's uh, we have also so since not every. Uh, not not every code, so not this year and Lada has have different metadata on their speakers. Uh, we can only use part of the data actually right now to combine. And then uh, text. Uh, texts are uh, modifier and sub X, and they are uh, they, they come with their own descriptions. Uh, this is uh, perhaps important. So it's it's not enough to say it's a greeting, but uh, it's, it's uh, to be able uh, to be as, as inter subjective as possible. Um, um, so we allow a, a, a short description of the text, of, of the deck used uh, in some circumstances, such that uh, people can, can trace uh, those taggings annotations back. And separately, the annotations. So each token uh, of the text uh, will be, can can be attributed uh, actually to multiple texts. Um, we there are two big categories uh, as we have learned in the previous lecture. Um, there are modifiers and there are sub X. Um, and and actually, uh, each token in the in the data model of the ladder. A web app can be uh, each token can be attributed uh, to any number of texts. Uh, of course, it's not uh, sensible to do that, but but uh, this is possible. So polysemic uh, analysis can be done, um, uh, but but it's not used right now. You just have uh, modifiers and subtax. and additionally, uh, um, data are registered users. Uh, so. Uh, re we allow register uh, user registration for uh, yeah because we want people to be able to store data to add more data um, uh, to the web app and uh, we don't want that anybody can do that or rather uh, without with uh, to can do that without uh, prior confirmation from from our side due to uh, security concerns. So next slide, please. 
um, how does the so the applications uh in uh, create uh, the application can 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 learn so they use um machine learning uh, techniques uh to predict uh for a new text which token uh, might be attributed to which the to which tag uh it does the following uh, whenever there is a text coming in there will be a preprocessing that means uh we use a Unicode normaliz normalization uh, to, to filter out uh, different ways to write uh, umlauts and uh, diacritics. And then the se there will be a sentence uh, segmentation. Uh, right now we use the, the uh, Apache NLP or OpenLP sentence section model for that. Uh, then they will be tokenized. Uh, the text will be tokenized uh, right now using a regular expression. And then uh, we lowercase them. So this is the, this is all we do. Uh, and during the tokenization, most of the punctuations are filtered out. Um, still, the end of sentence uh, marker uh, is kept in. And then um, a pre-trained model is used uh, using statistical means um, to predict whether the each token. Um, can be attributed with some uh with, with a tag. Uh, basically, it's uh, we use for each language, and each tag uh, there will be a separate uh binary model, bad binary tagger, means uh the tagger just has to say, uh this to, uh, to say uh hey guys hey, to the, hey uh how how um probably it is, uh that this is say, um, um, a cancellation or a, a, re a request, uh, it's probably say 10% that would be, it would be taken out. But uh, for greeting, uh, the, this percentage should be higher. And, and so it goes really for, for, for each token, token by token, um, uh, within one document, within one, one, one document that's, um, so the, the text is entered into the uh, prompt uh, is analyzed as a, as a whole. And uh, we do not have any prior trained models. Uh, we, just, we just use the currently available data in, in uh, this DR and later for this task. How are the data right now um, stored? Uh, all data are stored in a, a relational database, uh, except the um, the trained models um, that that uh, use. They are uh, these are stored in, in the file system, and the IT IT service the seat of the University of Innsbruck uh, is hosting the server. Uh, right now, not really, but right now we have only a, a testing purpose server. But uh, the in in the end, those data are managed by the by the university. Uh, information so so um, uh, information service IT service department. Uh, those data in 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 the, in the database uh are downloadable for different in different formats. Uh, the basic format for for the application is uh JSON. JavaScript uh, uh, object notation uh, because it's, it, JSON is uh, is able to to capture linked uh, objects a bit better than than just using CSV. Uh, but of course the the text and the metadata and notate the places and notate tokens can be exported uh, using CSV too. Uh, a CSV is the most used uh, uh, format for, for machine learning purposes. Um, uh, to, to be able to capture uh, the annotation part uh, XML TI uh, export is also possible. Um, and actually uh, all data can be can be uh, or should be able to be to be called uh, using the so-called REST API. Um, the 
web application allows a uh, registered user to add new data. Uh, it's maybe there will be a, a demonstration or uh, we can see that. So um, if I, you... I yes? will say, uh, I will demonstrate it later. Yes, yeah. good. Mm -hmm. uh, and there are some, some privacy issues. Um, on the, the, so when we design so uh, when we design the application, we thought that uh, um, maybe it's not so good if people can can trace back who is writing what. Therefore, the metadata on speaker covers uh, only age, uh, gender, L one, two, and location, and not more. Uh, we think that uh, this is uh, perhaps a good enough for research, uh, and also good enough. Uh, for privacy, and the the old ID, uh, is used uh as a secondary pre precautions, uh measures such that if somebody think, um the the data, in the database is wrong, uh they can use use the old ID to trace back the original data, and that's um that's also one of the concerns um uh, I had at least. In, uh, by designing the application. Next slide, please. Uh, how do we comply to the uh, FAIR principles? Uh, find the accessible, interoperable, and reusable. Um, the data should be able to, so we use uh, data repositories. So uh, right now, uh, Senodo uh, research uh, data repository of the University of Innsbruck are used for ladder uh corpora corpus and um Ahe and this year will be Ahe will also host uh ladder and this year a cobra. Um I'm not sure if what would happen if we add new data to the to the web application and uh but I think I think kind of a of, uh, uh, meta data uh, OAI uh, meta protocol for meta data harvesting PMH uh, protocol can be implemented. Uh, the um, as I have said prior, uh, the the data documentation uh, uh, is very important. So actually, each tag, each uh, text uh, should be as documented. Uh, as good as possible, such that uh, people can use them for their for their for their own use for their own research, and there will be a, uh, all data are, are licensed, uh, of course, by CC BY, uh, and the software will also be licensed. So at least um, the 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 source code uh, will be able to. Uh, uh, it's managed by using the GitLab uh, repository of the university right now, but we plan to to export it once it's done um, yeah, through GitHub, uh, such that it can be yeah uh, improved by all people. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so we, I, I think we can skip this. Uh, so uh, some limitation and, and maybe uh, future improvements. So the annotation capability is actually quite low. Uh, the reason is that we do not have many, many uh, incidences for each tag. Uh, this is uh, simply a, a data quantity uh, um, nature. Um, using Apache Open NLP is, is one one way to do it. Uh, we have tried out a uh, Stanford uh, tagger also, but right now the Apache uh, Open NLP delivers um, yeah a bit better result. Uh, but this is still actually uh quite improvable. Um. I have no idea whether this will be can be improved uh, in Rust, but uh, I guess so. If we have lots lots of data, um, 
So there, for some some tech, there are just simply two or three incidences uh, in the whole corpora, and that's just not enough. Uh, the web, as you will see, uh, it's it's actually not very user friendly. Um, but we we get actually an uh, um um uh, just today, right? We get an. Yes. Uh, yes. a, a design proposal by a professional web designer and it looks already uh, much better. Uh, the search and search results are quite, uh, they are not, so the interface is not in, in it's not intuitive uh, and the results can be unexpected. Um, this has something to do with the, with, with the idea and search. Uh, that was that's just my own idea, and that's not compatible with most users, of course. Uh, we will have to find a, a solution also for this uh, together with the, with the web designer. Um, and currently, the text pre-processing is uh, is the yeah it trades information for functionality. So we, in order to get more uh, better text. Uh, we script out uh, punctuations, for example, uh, but maybe maybe so with with increased quantity of data, uh, we expect that we can actually uh, do less pre-processing, keep more data, more information within texts and in the models, and still get good results. Uh, at least that's our hope. Thank you very much. You. I, I would now to uh, go uh, through um, the main feature uh, of uh, the ladder web that uh, a final user can really get. So first, uh, I will I will do it with uh, three videos and some screenshots that uh, we took uh, last week. Uh, the the uh, model, as uh, uh, Josef said, uh, was not. Uh, so the interface was not um, uh, the, the final one, but um, uh, uh, wait a little bit back. So the first video, I will show you the um, annotation wizard. So what can you do if you are uh, not registered? Uh, the second video will uh, show you how to fit the data set and the training the system. And the third video will find uh, how to find and export uh, selected data. And finally, uh, I will so show in some screenshots how to promote the reusability of this app. Uh, as a not log in um, uh, user, uh, you will see this interface. We will uh, have a, a description and some instruction element. And then you uh, will uh, be able to click in the central button where you find annotated text. So a window will pop up and uh, you can enter your text. In this case, uh, in Italian, uh, scusa ma non posso venire. Sorry, but I cannot come. And um, so I skip one minute act here. Scusa ma non posso venire. And after all, we, you can select the language uh, in the uh, window here. So you find a menu and then you click on annotate. And uh, uh, the machine will give you a result. Um, so it's suggestion. Scusa will uh, analyze as we tag it as a remedial move. Apology, ma non posso venire, uh, is a cancellation, impossibility. Uh, rimandiamo a domani is an offer of repair with an unclear alternative. If you um, are a registered user, you have uh, some uh, more uh, possibilities. So you see you see uh, the menu uh, uh, here, the bar on the top is a little bit changed, uh, but uh, the procedure is almost the same. So you go to annotate the text, you write uh, your text uh, inside the window and uh, you ask for annotation. Yes, and uh, you will get uh, an annotation proposal. And in this case, you have a, one more button here, add as a new text. You click on add on a text 
and a new window will pop up and you can insert metadata like uh, an alternative identifier, um, a language and a creation task. So which uh, prompt you use in the, your DCT um, to elicit this data and some other uh, metadata. And then you click on save and you will find your text, annotated text uh, in the uh, database. Here you have last changes in the database, you find uh, your annotated text with your metadata and also with your text, your annotation. If you click here, you can look back to the annotation. You uh, add an automatic annotation and you find the annotation you you have selected before. And uh, now you can also change uh, this annotation by uh, selecting, deselecting the previous annotation and selecting a new one. You have to save edit sub X. Then uh, you save uh, your change it annotation. And uh, you go back to last change and you can see now the message the same, but uh, the annotation is uh, a little bit different than the, uh, so you change it before. And uh, doing so, you can uh, save your re results and the result will um, train the machine. Um, once uh, uh, in a day, the system will up, uh, update automatically. So, and uh, in the next video, uh, I will show you the function search and export, which can be very useful for didactical uh, purposes or for research. Um, so inside the menu, uh, wait, uh, inside the menu uh, manage data, you go to find a text and you can add a query and you can search something by a lexical item or uh, as a tag or as a sub act or as a uh, using a task. So for example, here we are asking for, to, um, to, yeah, do you have any menu? And you can choose between several options but we decide to uh, search uh, for lexical item, for example, hey, in, uh, we have to select the language, we select German and the, the query is created. And when you close uh, uh, the machine search and uh, find all um, messages that contain this le uh, lexical item, hey, took me a light, you can see uh, and you can see also the annotation. So A is annotated as alerter in this context. And uh, you can also download your results uh, in the previous mentioned format, JSON, DAI, XML, or GSV, which can be also open in uh, Excel. So uh, I come now to the... Um, screenshots that I mentioned before. Um, so the uh, ladder web can also uh, extend um, its um, um, uh, possibility because it's a flexible tool that allow to uh, create, uh, add a new task. Uh, if you want, for example, if you want to add some uh, data that is not, uh, they are not coming from um, this uh, DCT, but for example, you would like to add other data coming from other speech acts, you can uh, use this function. The same if you find data of, uh, that uh, um, cannot be uh, categorized with uh, uh, this uh, sub act uh, scheme, you can uh, add uh, uh, modifiers and sub acts. So, and uh, um, yeah, I would like to show you some example of uh, annotation suggestion. And uh, on this slide, 
and in the follow slides too, one can observe annotation suggestion for um, a cancellation in Italian on the left and the same cancellation. So I uh, made uh, the translation um, on the right. So these data are not in the corpus, uh, but I brought this data and I asked uh, um, Lager, uh, Lager Web to uh, propose me a uh, annotation. So in this case, purtroppo non posso venire, mi dispiace, possiamo vederci domani. In English, uh, unfortunately, unfortunately, I can come. Sorry, I'm so sorry. Can we uh, see us tomorrow? Can we meet tomorrow? And uh, the uh, suggested um, annotation is correct, both in Italian and in German. However, if we ask for a less standard um, cancellation, the um, system meets some problem uh, in con In this slide, not all subacts uh, uh, have been recognized by the system. The system encounter the similar challenges both in Italian and in German. Um, and finally, I try to make um, uh, annotate a request. Uh, sorry, uh, yes, a request. And uh, as you probably remember, the corpus of request was tagged on, only in Italian. So we uh, don't expect that. Uh, this machine is able to um, uh, recognize uh, requests in other language but Italian. Indeed, um, in the message, ciao, ho dimenticato il mio portafoglio a casa. Non è che per caso potresti portarmi il tuo. So, sorry, I forgot my wallet at home. Uh, it's possible that you give me, uh, borrow me some money. Uh, and I translated that in German. Uh, so you see, in Italian, the annotation is quite uh, okay. Some items are not recognized. So, for example, ciao is not recognized, but uh, the other are almost uh, recognized with some um, missing elements. Uh, but in German, uh, it, of course, is above the possibility of uh, the uh, machine. This is why uh, nowadays, uh, so um, till now, the uh, ladder web is not a Finnish um, product, but uh, it's just a, um, a prototype, a prototype that needs to be uh, developed. And uh, uh, we are happy uh, for every help. Um, so get involved in ladder web to create a more powerful annotation assistant and facilitate our corpus-based pragmatic research. Um, ladder web is not yet online, but it will be in the few next weeks uh, under this uh, URL. EFT minus ladder web in the next uh, final chapter, we we are looking for we um, we show some um, sorry we show uh, some um, uh, evidence how data driven learning can be used for um, pragmatic awareness uh, and we also uh, connect the ladder web and its possible use for pragmatic learning in teacher education. So data-driven learning is uh, an uh, instructional approach that integrates, uh, integrates language corpora into language education, allowing learners to discover linguistic partners, usage and variation through direct interaction with authentic language data. DDL is, is a... Um, is inductive is very inductive approach between the benefit of ddl uh, the literature accounts uh, the authenticity uh, not later please not today uh, authenticity language exposure um, since uh, ddl engage learners with real world language use 
uh, behind uh, behind textbook examples, promote awareness of language forms and function, enhancing acquisition, and learner autonomy, builds research and analytical skills, encouraging self-directed learning. Yeah, in, in, a, in a study of uh, um, a recent study of last year, Luciana Forti explore. Um, so, sorry, I, I missed the connection. Um, so, now data driven learning is generally an approach to learn foreign languages. And uh, uh, I would like now to show some evidence how data driven learning um, is um, effective for do that. And uh, after that, I show how data-driven learning can also improve um, uh, pragmatic awareness. Uh, there is not so many uh, research on data-driven learning. Uh, so I uh, show um, a, a recent study uh, from uh, Luciana Forti. In a study, a study of 2023, um, the author explores enhancing phraseological competences in Italian L2 among adult Chinese learners using data-driven learning approach. Over eight weeks, learner focused in communicative setting of verb nouns collocation for one hour weekly. The study divided participants into two groups, one experimental group using DDL with pre-selected materials and a control group without DDL. The aim was access. The aim uh, was to access DDL efficient, effective, uh, efficiency, so effectiveness in developing and retaining phraseological competences evaluated through qualitative analysis of texts. More particular, the research questions were: How does phraseological competence develop over time when comparing? a DDL versus non-DDL approach. And research question two, how is the retention rate after four weeks? The groups were tested before, during, and after, uh, directly after the intervention, and finally four weeks after the end of the lessons. This figure shows the progression in the acquisition of phraseological items. And uh, the control group uh, and the experimental group don't show any significant difference in any time of, um, of, um, of the test. Uh, however, the experimental group demonstrated better retention rates on the phraseological items compared to the control group. So the question is now whether DDL can also be effective in other contexts, as for example, in enhancing pragmatic awareness of uh, uh, pre-service teachers. As non-native speakers of a second language, it is crucial for L2 teachers to grasp the pragmatic nuances in a language, in the language they teach, which L2 also for themselves. This understanding enhances, this understanding enhances the effectiveness in communication, instruction, and feedback to the foreign language students. In a submitted paper, Elena Nuzzo and I uh, worked with LIDAR data to investigate the following research question. How do pre-service teachers using DDL improve their pragmatic competencies? To reply to this question, we conducted a four-week learning module at the University of Innsbruck focusing on formal, formal email writing. The pre-service teacher conducted a cross-language comparison analyzing the corpus letter containing both L1 and L2 emails. Our approach involved a mixed method analysis to assess improvements in pragmatic understanding and application. The pre-service teacher were asked to assess the adequacy of five emails using a five-point Likert scale before and after the intervention. The judgment were then compared with a model value of a baseline of L1 speakers. And here you can see the results pre and after the intervention. So the results indicates a low but significant enhancement of agreement after the intervention. Uh, it's noteworthy that the agreement was already high 
before the intervention. So um, there is a low but significant uh, enhancement of the agreement after the intervention. After an intervention, qualitative results reveal an enhanced ability in recognizing pragmatic infelicity and suggesting more appropriate forms as demonstrated by the following example. For example, uh, I would correct the sick, which means her, um, mister in Italian, with prof, given that they are dealing with a professor. I would use conditional mood to be more polite. Tanti saluti is too informal. Uh, part three is impolite. The explanation for the reason is too, di too direct. In part one, it is not possible to spettabile because the salutation is used for business email only. However, this encouraging result are not significantly uh, different, uh, are not significantly differ from those observed before the intervention. So all in all, we observed some interesting development regarding learner autonomy, understanding of pragmatics, and teaching strategy grasp among pre-service teachers. Firstly, we found evidence of the independent investigation, analysis, and reflection of pragmatic issues, indicating positive shift toward learner's autonomy. In terms of understanding pragmatics, we noticed a partial but significant improvement. In conclusion, our study, our study highlights the effectiveness of data-driven learning approach in fostering autonomy and proactive stance of the world understanding pragmatics among pre-service teachers. This offers a valuable direction for enhancing teacher training program. program. So when to use ladder web? Uh, we think that for pre-service teacher, annotating online with the help of ladder web annotation assistant can drive them forward making autonomous observation. This process enhanced the, uh, can enhance the evidence-driven analytical competence both in L1 and L2 data, making a significant step toward independent teacher proficiency. For in-service teachers, we imagine two key areas of impact. Firstly, in the preparation of teacher activities to select material, extract present, authentic, uh, extract and present authentic and variable input to their learners. Secondly, in the diagnostic of learning performances, in-service teachers can use innovative methods such as comparing their own corpus, uh, learner corpus with pre-annotated L1 products and analyze learning developments. These approaches can help understand the learner progress and tailoring teaching strategy accordingly. However, some limitation, uh, ladder web offers significant advantage for data learning pragmatic studies, especially as data volume increase. But the minimum data volume to obtain a sufficient uh, reliable annotation is high. Annotating new data can be frustrating ta a frustrating task for individuals. Therefore, the benefit for individual st students, for example, in a university thesis is limited. So, in order to address the implications of the letter web, among others, we would like to briefly connect it with the training of prospective foreign language teachers at Innsbruck University, as Nicola has already mentioned. So, research-based training is, of course, a central aspect of our program, as in other universities as well, I would say. Here in Innsbruck, students are currently completing a four-year bachelor's and a two-year master's program, during which they are also gradually introduced to research. Nevertheless, one of the central aims of the whole program is to ensure that future teachers achieve an action-oriented language competence and can convey this to their future learning. So one of the declared aims is the action-oriented language competence in theory and practice. So we can say one module of our language teaching program focuses on the learning and teaching of foreign languages, primarily using the action-oriented approach. This is the currently predominant method of achieving our goal and has already been stated in the Common European Framework of Reference for Languages and its companion volume, as you can see on the slide. So the real life situations and expressing themselves and accomplishing tasks of different natures are in the focus. 
This is where LetterWeb comes into play as Corpora can be used to promote the action-oriented approach and the underlying pragmatic competence. And again, according to the CEFRO, pragmatic competence is concerned with actual language use in the co-construction of text. So pragmatic competence is thus primarily concerned with the user and the learner's knowledge of the principles of language use, as Elena Nutzo has already mentioned as well. So we can further subdivide this pragmatic competence I just mentioned it briefly, there are like different competences, the discourse, the functional and the design competence. And you see here the definition of the functional competence. And I just want to stress that here's the very, very relevant to have a look at the social cultural competence, which is very important for the letter web as well. So as already said, in one of the bachelor's modules, students have the opportunity to deal with corporate and foreign language teaching, especially in the Italian lessons. And working with corporate enables inductive work and so the independent discovery of rules, which can increase the motivation and the learning effect, especially for pragmatic competence and awareness. Furthermore, working with Corpora can be enriching, especially for selecting appropriate social linguistic choices. So the letter web currently provides examples of rejection, refusal and request, as we have seen, that can be used by teachers and learners, both in language teacher education and for their future and actual teaching in the language classroom. So the master courses in particular also enables a scientific discussion of corpora, which is also reflected in the corresponding master courses and thesis, as Maria Rudiger and Valentin Spieldeller have shown. So the results flow back in the training of teachers and enrich the teaching of graduates. Furthermore, Yes, we go ahead with the next slide. Furthermore, it would be interesting to extend the work with corporal to other languages as well. So to summarize, LetterWeb offers added value for training and teaching, and the concrete examples from LetterWeb in particular foster pragmatic competence and can also help to motivate learners. For teachers, they offer the opportunity to create activities and above all real-life tasks, which is once again in line with the action-oriented approach. From a research perspective, the letter web offers initial opportunities for research, for example, at master's level. And in addition, letter web expands and updates our knowledge of pragmatic competence in Italian. This could be also used to expand the profile for Italian languages. So the so-called profilo della lingua italiana, where there are currently still gaps. So this Italian profile is a supplementary tool to the CEFRA and aims to define the levels A1 to B2 of the framework in terms of linguistic content. So it's language specific for Italian. Therefore, it can function as a basis for those who work at various levels in the field of teaching and learning Italian as an L2. And as already mentioned, there are still some gaps which can be filled, for example, using the letter web. For example, the scriptors are still missing for the injection via email. So we need the next slide at the A2 and B2 levels. So you see there is still a gap in these descriptors. In this descriptors and furthermore, the existing descriptors can be redefined and critically discussed based on the research on corpora presented today and concrete examples can be added. And the same is valid for the linguistic function respond to a proposal on the next slide by refusing where there is no descriptor for the B2 level and no examples for the A1 level and similarly the speech act responding to a request by refusing on the next slide could be extended by a B2 descriptor and further examples, especially on the A1 and B2 levels. So finally, 
LetterWeb can also provide an up-to-date basis for textbook authors. So overall, the LetterWeb serves as a starting point for further research, which in turn feeds into the training of future teachers and creates a virtual circle. So we would like to end this presentation and are very happy to answer any questions you have. Thank you very much, Eva. And now we can start uh, a discussion. Okay, Francesca, raise her uh, hand. Yeah, um, I have a question that um, uh, pertains also to the tool, uh, which I find very interesting. And indeed, I also like this idea of uh, integrating the work that you have done uh, with, uh, uh, in, with within teaching. And uh, uh, so um, the question would be, uh, how could uh, this tool be uh, supported or integrated uh, with uh, the Clarin infrastructure? And uh, this question is for, of course, all participants of the project, but also uh, for uh, the people from the Austrian Academy said that, in the sense that, uh, um, yeah, we would very much uh, like to add it to our collection of uh, uh, of tools and services, and uh, maybe make it interoperable with other corpora uh, if possible. So yeah, this is just uh, to raise the question. Yeah, uh, this uh, question implies uh, also technical aspect that uh, I I don't know. So, for example, you you told that uh, your infrastructure can uh, ha harvest between corpora, and uh, I imagine that I can look for um, uh, a research question between many corpora. And uh, but it may be different in our case because we use uh, a different annotation scheme that uh, is not common between traditional corpora. So I uh, I still don't know, but uh, I think uh, there is potential for collaboration, especially if um, there are also similar instruments um actually uh i i myself would be very interested in how to reuse uh already available clarin tools um i know some of them offered by by uh, by uh, austrian uh, center for digital humanities uh and, and none of the, those of which i know uh um it's somehow in 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 this task, um, uh, but but I I really would be interested in how to how to make these things interoperable. So the data export is one thing that's uh, certainly something that can be done uh, easily, or, or rather easily. But uh, to reuse those tools, uh, I I I I'm very open to suggestions. Mm -hmm. yeah, one easy answer in this case would be also that uh, um, you could reuse, if you want to use it, this tool for other languages, you could reuse at least uh, some uh, basic NLP services that are made available. For instance, uh, we have uh, for many languages uh, the uh, Czech uh, uh, chapter of the Clarion infrastructure has made available uh, NLP pipelines uh, in, in within the uh, UD pipe framework. So this these can be used as web services or APIs also mm -hmm. within other uh, tools. So this could be one one thing. And uh, yeah, another thing would be of course uh, if you want to integrate. Yeah, exactly. The switchboard is a is a great place to start looking for tools, and also maybe uh, the uh, um, the federated uh, sorry the federated identity uh, of Clarin so could be reused so the single sign on infrastructure in such a way that uh, uh, you could allow Clarin users uh, to easily log in into your application. Mm. And uh, if needed, you can get in touch with Clarin, the Clarin Technical Developers team, 
and you can ask for more specific information in this respect. Thank you very much. Thank um, you, they are very useful. Thank you. I, I can also just add from the Arche point of view, if they would be at what point um, the data annotated and stored in Arche as well, we and yeah, also for these, we are providing also an API access. So Arche is very often used as a backend to online application. I don't know if it's right. useful for you, but thank you. Uh, I, we have, I, I we have several happen. applications that where Arche is used as a backend for DEIs or so. Um, yeah. But of course, these applications yes. also are developed them separately. Um, I will scrutinize that. Um, it can help us with some some problems. Really, thank yeah. you. Yeah. So I think it's four o'clock. So we've uh, come to the end of uh, our cafe. Maybe we can uh, let uh, uh, Nicole. I don't know if it's you who are going to do the closing remarks, and then I will just make a few announcements, and we are uh, we are finished. Uh, I uh, thank all for um, attending this presentation and uh, uh, also for collaborating uh, in the creation of, uh, of this presentation. Thank you for request uh, for the uh, questions. Uh, I would remember that uh, the project was uh, founded by uh, Austrian Academic Science uh, and uh, Claria Ate. And uh, thank you very much for host, uh, us uh, and give the possibility to share our results uh, in at Claring Cafe. Thank you for uh, organizing uh, this and uh, for have or, uh, make it possible to have this interesting conversation about also the future development. If you can just uh, click uh, down, so these are a few links for you to stay uh, involved with uh, with Claren in particular, I recommend to join our news flash to get monthly updates and next slide. Uh, we will have another Claren Cafe on the 4th of April. And uh, uh, this is the topic, creating pedagogical corpora with annotation uh, of sensitive content and offensive language. Uh, it's another project uh, that will be presented. And uh, yeah, you can stay tuned for the next cafes at this address. Thank you very much uh, to everyone for joining us today and uh, see you next month.